Pete Kennedy of Graves Garden uh, was the person who argued the Steve Jackson Games case, uh, which we're here to talk about tonight. So Pete will bring the legal perspective to the conversation. Of course, Steve Jackson, front and center. Steve showed up on a BBS called SMOF telling us that his Illuminati BBS and all his other computers had been confiscated. He didn't know what the hell was going on and why they took them. It was a secret service. They came to his door. They were going to batter the thing in. Uh, and that's an interesting story in itself. Anyway, Steve was the wrong guy for them to pick on. So we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about what happened and what the response was. Bruce Sterling. Bruce wrote the book Hacker Crackdown, which was a thorough, comprehensive, and very cool journalistic account of what happened, not just with the Steve Jackson raid, but other uh, sort of interesting police activity of the time. Uh, EFF was formed by Mitch Kapoor, and John Perry Barlow, and uh, a few other people that they knew, and John Gilmore, absolutely, John Gilmore, uh, kind of a tribe of guys who could see that there was going to be trouble. Trouble was brewing because police didn't really understand technology, and they were getting bad information, and they were getting fired up. So that led to uh, some rather interesting uh, uh, problems, one of which was Steve Jackson raid. So I think the way for us to start tonight is just to ask Steve to give an account of uh, what happened and how he saw it at the time. Hi. Right. Okay. Thing one. Back away from the speaker. Back away from the light. No. Okay. Thing one is that I cannot see you out there. Well, I have no objection to questions, but people who have questions at any point are just going to have to come toward the front and wave their hands and be busy. Anyway, hi. I'm Steve Jackson. I make games. I've been doing it for 30 years now. There was a little interruption 20 years ago, which might very well have have put me out of that business if not for the tenacious activism of Mike Godwin and the righteous indignation backed up with money and effort that, that came from the founders of the EFF. What did it look like from my point of view? Well, what it looked like from my point of view was a phone call in the morning saying, Steve, the, our, our offices are full of police of the Secret Service and they're not letting anyone in. And that's not a good way to start your day. <laughs> but that changed my life for the next few years. Um, there's, I want to sit up, let's see if it beeps. We'll see if we can get away with that. My back likes this position better. Um, there's no way that I can really tell the story of the next few years in the next few minutes. And it's been very well told different places, including our website, uh, Bruce's book. is the best journalistic work ever done on it. A little aside, one of my takeaways from this was that the national media is helpless can't find out stories, copies from each other. Um, I was very disappointed in the national media, just as I was very disappointed in our national police, because my only indignation about the Secret Service was not that they had inconvenienced me, although they had, euphemism alert, inconvenience, but that they had done so in such a blundering, incompetent, careless way. 
and that they were so self-righteously sure that they knew what they were doing, when in fact they did not. They were afraid of all the wrong things. They were, they were chasing a demon that was not there. Uh, ultimately, the reason that they were in my offices was not the Burp Cyberpunk book, though they led everyone to believe that for months. They were on the trail of the notorious uh, 911 document, which, uh, which the, the federal government had been led to believe was valued at some $80,000, which its owners, in fact, uh, were, were selling for 13 bucks. The whole thing was a comedy of errors. Um, not funny for the people who lost their jobs over it. Um, some good came out of it, and you know, Pete will talk about it uh, in more detail than I can, but basically we established in court that the operator of a, a bulletin board system is entitled to constitutional protections. That, or to put it more broadly, that speech on the internet is speech and protected. That seems to have stuck. So we have a little improvement for all that problem, and I'll hand it back to John now. I did want to make one more thanks that I didn't think about. Chris Boyd with Midas Networks. Chris is making sure that we're streaming this and we have a good network. Okay. Streaming, yay. I should make another point. 20 years ago, we all thought we were connected. We have no idea what connected meant. Just, hello world. <laughs> So the reason this, uh, this thing happened was because some guy named Lynn Rose had swiped this 9-11 document and was sending it around. Uh, it found its way into a, a newsletter of the Legion of Doom, which was a bunch of hacker kids basically uh, sending the thing around uh, in the newsletter called Thrack, P-H-R-A-C-K. And uh, uh, somebody who worked for Steve was was uh, one of the members of the Legion of Doom got this newsletter. But I want to account, I want to repeat something. I want you to tell me if this is true. My recollection is that Lloyd, the guy who uh, actually received the newsletter when it came to the Steve Jackson games, was at his house and the Secret Service showed up there and that they were talking to him and they were about to batter the door down. What happened there? Okay. Uh, Lloyd was our managing editor. Um, he was also a computer hobbyist. He ran a BBS of his own. That's where the notorious document uh, showed up. No, they, there was no copy anywhere in our offices of the document that they trashed us to find. It. But now, I wasn't there, but, but my understanding is that the only reason our office door was not battered down by the minions of law and order was that Lloyd, standing in his underwear, surrounded by Secret Service agents who had already, you know, burst into his apartment, uh, was that Lloyd heard their chatter about now and now we're going to take the door down. He said, no, no, I have a key and, and persuaded them not to destroy the office. You know, of course, you know, once, once they got in, they they did a lot of random search and damage. Uh, apparently tried to pick the lock on filing cabinets with, with our letter openers, and so on and so on. Your tax dollars at play. But no, the best of my understanding is the only reason they did not smash down our door to gain entry is that their earlier victim was standing there going, oh, no, I have a key. A question for Bruce. Bruce, how did you hear about this and how did you respond? Well, I have to say I responded very slowly because, uh, you know, it just seemed so odd that I assumed the, the entire enterprise would blow over because it was just, it was, you know, it, it was implausible on its face that the Secret Service would be raiding a, a, a you know, science fiction gaming publisher. So, you know, I, I naturally assumed that there had just been some ridiculous and, and, and comic 
identity mistake and that there would be sort of sheepish apologies within a couple of weeks. Or there was always the possibility that there was some kind of horrible skullduggery going on at Steve Jackson Day. You never know. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people in there. Perhaps they were burying bodies in the basement. You know, in, in which case they would be, you know, the, well, the, well, whatever. You know, in which case there would be some formal charges, right? I mean, there would be a lawsuit or, you know, a criminal charges, and that would be of great interest. But then I realized, you know, after a period of time, that there were, there were not going to be any charges, and there were not going to be any arrests. And then all of the computers, which had vanished from this publisher's place, were not going to be replaced. And, um, and that the, the effect of this raid was to extra-legally bankrupt a publisher. And, you know, at that point, I grew quite concerned. So I wrote first an article about it for a science fiction magazine in Britain because I was doing a column at the time. And then I began to ask around and I began to get wind of other operations that had happened all over the United States that were being carried out by uh, you know, a, a nebulous group of very activist American computer police. And at that point, I mean, I, I was not a journalist. I was trained as a journalist. I have a journalism degree, but I made the mistake of writing a novel in college, so I just became a novelist. But at that point, you know, I finally figured, well, you know, this is why I went to school for four years, and it's time for me to write some nonfiction about this subject. So I did begin writing nonfiction. And I must say that along with the, the Steve's raid changed my life as well. I, I doubt that uh, I doubt that without this event that happened at Steve Jackson Games, that I would have done anywhere near so much nonfiction writing as I have done. And nowadays I write much more nonfiction than fiction. So um, it was a seminal event which changed many people's lives, not least, I must say, the life of William J. Cook, whose name has not come up here, but he was the he was the genius of the Steve Jackson raid. It, it's uh, his story. I mean, I, you know, when I realized that he was the guy whose plan this had been, and that it was really Mr. Cook's ideas that had brought this whole woe upon people, I was naturally very angry with it. But I must say that after 20 years, my perspective about that has changed. And I've come to see, really, the sorrow of it. Well, perhaps you should explain who Bill Cook is. He's, he's, he, yeah, it's, it's like our legal expert to weigh in there. Well, Bill Cook was the, was the assistant U.S. attorney who was out of Chicago and in charge of the investigation. Um, you know, which, which investigation? Right, well, a, a series of them. And you know, Bruce and I may differ a little bit as to who the evil genius behind it was. I always had concerns about Belfort and a security investigator in the private uh, research arm of the Baby Bell companies out of New Jersey who was generating a lot of the affidavits that were used in support of not just the raid, uh, the Steve Jackson games, but other raids, and was the person behind the evaluation, for instance, of this 911 document, which they were searching for here in Austin. And this 911 document is essentially a, a textual description of the way 911 services were provided without anything in it that was actually confidential, that would actually a 911 security system, but it had been hacked, and it had been published in this private newsletter, and it did end up on Lloyd's PBS. It was home, it was never in games, but there were affidavits, for instance, asserting that the value of this document was $79,000 plus, and when I talked to the Bell South person who had come up with that valuation, Asked him, well, how'd you come up with $79,000? a pretty valuable document, $79,000. And 
And it turned out part of what went into that was not just the cost of the software which was used to write it, but the computers on which the software was scored on which they wrote the document. As if every letter I write in my office is going to cost three or four or five thousand dollars because somebody had to buy the computer and make the software. And, and they were providing affidavits that suggested these things were far more valuable than they were, I believe, in order to get federal law enforcement interest. Because if you go to the feds and you say something got stolen and they say what it was worth, so well, it wasn't worth much, but they stole it from me. And they say, but it was worth seventy-nine thousand dollars. Okay, I can take that to my boss. They might be interested in putting it together. Right. Yeah. So it's a, one thing that's important to understand about this is that this is kind of like a panty rate. It's like a bunch of kids going out to show that they could get something they weren't supposed to be able to get and bring it back and say, look what I got. So it was really not a huge security risk. This is the insight that Barlow had that led him to start thinking about how, oh, we need to have some kind of foundation or something to address this problem. Because he had been talking, they did a conversation on the well that was published well as an online community that was published in Harper's Magazine where some of these kids showed up and it was clear that they were going to get themselves in a lot of trouble even though they weren't really criminals. Just to clarify, because I was confused for a minute, when John talks about a panty raid, he's not talking about the raid on Steve Jackson. <laughs> uh, if, they, if, if they got any of those, we never got them back and, they, and we don't know about it. Uh, but no, he's talking about the the hacker exploit that secured a copy of the 911 document from an uh, from an unsecured Bell South computer. It it was really no big stunt to get in there, but it was naughty. They were someplace they weren't supposed to be. And look, we copied this boring, confusing file just to show we were there. That's the panty grade aspect, and, and many things did come from that ill-advised little prank. The, the Secret Service, right? I mean, I mean that's one of the weird things about the case, right? Is, is the raid was conducted by the Secret Service, who most of us think are trained to take a bullet for the president, uh, not to do sophisticated computer hacking investigation. But it turned out, I mean, Secret Service is under Treasury. They do have authority to investigate uh, primarily counterfeiting, uh, which is you know, a crime against the Treasury and against funds. But for some reason, at the time, and they still have it, but I don't think they use it very actively anymore, at the time they had overlapping jurisdiction with the FBI to investigate computer crime, domestic computer crimes. And so you can sort of see within this investigation there was some uh, you know, an interest, an ambition for the Secret Service to be involved in high-tech, cutting-edge criminal investigation. And again, I'm speculating, but I suspect more naive than the FBI, probably more easily led by a federal prosecutor or by Belcor into going and conducting the, the name raid in Texas and to take, you know, sort of the credit for it where the Secret Service were out there more than simply the Protection Service. And I had a couple of these guys on the road. Uh, only time I've taken depositions of people who were packing Uzi uh, <laughs> during the deposition. And you know, honestly, they were, you know, dedicated law enforcement officers, but not particularly bright and not tech savvy in, at all didn't really understand what they were doing, they were sort of executing orders. And that's what led to this sort of, I would call it a comedy of errors, but it wasn't my business that took the hit. Uh, but, you know, a real Keystone Cop sort of series of events that led to them, not just raiding Lloyd's house, but it was at least a bullet board system that at least had this document, sort of innocuous document that it was, but then saying, well, he works for Steve Jackson Games. Steve Jackson Games also has a bullet board system. Lloyd Blankenship has a bullet board system. Their bullet board system, you know, 
Phoenix Bullet Board was kind of funky at the time. Right? There was the Illuminati, there was discussions about scary. Yeah, scary about the, you know, <laughs> the conspiracy of the Illuminati at all. And I think they saw that and said, oh, holy crap, these guys are involved in it. You better hit them as part of the ring. I'm not sure that they have gotten much past they have a bulletin board system because one of the big features that came out um, when we got into court and he got to depose people and so on was the amazing lack of previous investigation that they had done about Steve Jackson games before they got a judge to give them a sealed order that, that would let them come in and toss the place. Um, and one of the things that isn't played up very much is this was sealed. We, uh, nobody was allowed to know why they were in there. Would you like to talk a little bit about how unusual that is? Well, you know, they didn't want Yeah, I mean, they sealed the search warrants so that after they conducted the raid, Steve, and I, I, I came in a little later on this um, personally, but after they conducted the raid, Steve was like, what has happened? My bulletin board system computer was taken. Lloyd, Lloyd's computer was taken. Uh, whole boxes of floppy disks were taken. With no explanation as to why. And, and so he didn't know what was, what was going on. And what was taken wasn't just bulletin board system that they used for game testing, that they used to communicate with their customers, you know, that they used to sort of stay connected with this, you know, spread out series of gamers, um, had electronic mail on it and all, but also there was a draft of their most, you know, their, their upcoming game, GURP Cyberpunk, which is a role-playing game in the system that Steve has developed that coincidentally, in this situation, involved pretending in a Dungeons and Dragons situation that you're hacking into computers. So the Secret Service seizes the computer. They print out these graphs of a role-playing game. Not, not a computer game, but literally a role-playing, roll-the-12-sided roll dice kind of role-playing game, where there's descriptions of the points that you get if you're this type of a hacker or that type of a hacker. They print it out and literally conclude it's a handbook for computer crime. <laughs> they actually use that phrase. The handbook for computer crime. The other phrase they used was, this is real. Yeah. So if you ever, okay. So if you ever hear people frothing about, yes, some people can't tell role-playing games from reality, well, you may find it hard to believe that some people can't tell role-playing games from reality. But 20 years ago, they existed, and they were on the federal payroll carrying guns. <laughs> well, when I was writing this up, the, the thing that the thing that bugged me, you know, the, the, way, the thing I wanted to find out was how could such a thing have happened? And, you know, I, I think I, I knew. Well, I, I know as much and published as much as anybody is ever going to know about. But maybe if you think of them as like, of the perpetrators of the raid, as like a very disturbed group of like CSI guys from the television series, okay, you've got the attorney and you've got the private investigator, Belfort, corporate security guy, and you've got the Secret Service guy. And they're really a triad and they're all necessary. Because you have to have the attorney who's ready to bring the indictment. And you have to have the Belcourt guy who's really ready to complain that some kind of punishable crime has been committed. And then you need the Secret Service guy to be your arms and legs on the ground and actually kick the door open. And, you know, it, it came a cropper so quickly and in so many ways that it really shocked the people who were involved. And I don't think they ever expected this to happen. I mean, the context in which this raid was planned there were so many hacker computers seized in the four or five year period before this particular bulletin board system was seized. Not just one or five or 10, dozens, dozens and dozens of computers were seized. There was never any 
outcry about it. Nobody whose computers were seized ever sued. Every last one of them was completely intimidated by the Secret Service. The mere fact that the Secret Service had shown up was enough to make them hide their heads and never raise their voices. We still don't know who these people were. The people in the Sun Devil raids. You know, and Cook was associated with that. He was not, he was not a major architect of Sun Devil, but he had seen people in the Sun Devil raids carry out raids of the length and breadth of the United States with secret raids by, by, by armed police breaking into private homes, breaking into places of business, and hauling off computers without a peep of protest from anyone. You know, and why didn't these people yell as Steve Jackson yelled? I mean, why didn't they like leap up and defend their First Amendment rights? It's because they were crooks. I mean, they had all committed computer crimes. And they all knew better than to sort of jump up and say, gee, the Secret Service was here and they like carried off my carding unit. We could speculate that, but as Bruce says, we don't know who all these people were. We just know that whoever they were, they were terrified by the armed Secret Service agents coming into their houses with guns. And, you know, most of these are kids, many of them still living with their parents. That's a terrifying thing to happen. And if they tell you you've been bad, you probably believe it. But I'm not willing to say, based on what we've seen of how carelessly these guys investigate, that every home that they broke into, every computer that they took, was the instrument of even a technical crime. These guys were confused and careless and they were very intimidating. Some of those kids may really not have done anything except showed up on hacker bulletin boards and talked about, wow, you know, can you blah, blah, blah. We don't know. I bet we'll never know. We, we will certainly never know. And it may be that some of them were in fact innocent and for, you know, I don't believe any of them were actually publishers. But um, I mean, that was the, uh, well, you know, they may have been, as, 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 as 20 years later, it's beyond the statute of limitations or whatever. I do not believe that they were careless and confused. I do believe they were reckless and ambitious. And uh, they had, you know, kind of a, uh, they had a dot-com mentality within a law enforcement context. <laughs> so, you know, you have to remember this was 1991. I mean, there were not, there were, I mean, William Cook, I think, understood computers pretty well. He still understands computers. He's still, he's in private practice now, and he works for, you know, intellectual property law firm in, 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 uh, in, um, in Chicago, you know, which is, which is his hometown. I don't think Tim, the Secret Service guy, was ever wrist slapped. You know, I think probably people at the Secret Service who have tremendous esprit de corps, they probably envied him for having gotten into as much hot water as he did. And this Belcourt guy, he retired not long after this event. And he's, you know, if he's still alive, he's living on a pension. So the only guy who, whose career came a cropper from this was Cook. And that's why I named him as the main villain in the piece. No, and I really see him as more of a kind of Richard III character. A guy, you know, a guy gnawed by ambition. I mean, a, 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 you know, a Vietnam War fan, a hard-charging, tough guy. I mean, it, it, I've met his once. I mean, he's this very small, you know, mild-mannered, but Napoleonic figure, right? And, and if only, if only, the Steve Jackson Games computers had actually been a nest of Legion of Doom subversion. You know, that, if only that had been the case, the guy might be Attorney General now. You know, and, and you're laughing, but it's very sad because, well, you know, you're laughing sadly. I mean, you, you would not laugh if you knew what Howard Schmidt is going through right now. I mean, Howard Schmidt is Obama's current cybersecurity coordinator. He's in the office of the President of the United States. He was one of Cook's 
friends. He was one of my major informants for this book. He worked, he was head of security for Microsoft, Howard Schmidt. Howard Schmidt is a Cook figure who was not as ambitious as Cook and did not do the foolish things Cook did that ruined Cook's career. I mean, Howard kept his nose clean and he certainly knows more about computer security than 99.99999% of everybody else in the planet, including everybody else in this room. And due to the, the miserable incapacity of the police in the United States in combating computer crime, even though this guy is at the elbow of the president, he can accomplish practically nothing. And computer crime is all over the place. I mean, every one of us now opens a computer, we see five or six federal felonies in our email every day. I mean, there's four, what, nine fraud, there's people trying to build, oh gosh, zombie net computers, there's people carrying out <coughs> phishing frauds and trying to steal your bank notes. I mean, the level of lawlessness now compared to 1991 is just savage. You know, and this is, this is really Cook's legacy. I mean, that's what makes this an American tragedy. Not, you know, he, he went and he blew his own credibility and he set back the cause of law and order on computers pretty severely and now we're all paying for it and really an epidemic of online lawlessness. Not just in the United States, but all over the planet. So, would it have been better for the world if I'd grown older? <laughs> I, I don't think Cook was the right man for the job. I mean, there were, there were only maybe 30 people in 1990 who could have done the kind of, who had any interest in this. And, and the number of who were like federal attorneys like Cook, who actually could carry out interstate operations, maybe five guys. Scott Charney. I mean, he's a forgotten figure now, but at the time, Scott Charney was Cook's number one rival. Okay, he was ambitious, he was reckless, and he was jealous. He was also jealous. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to be the first ones to make the cases. He wanted to be the first guy to test unwritten, you know, untried federal law. He wanted to be a computer pioneer. He had a dot-com style mentality, you know? He just like, he was spitting on the 20-sided guys there. You know, and he thought maybe he'd become like the Bill Gates of American computer crime. You know, he had not put a foot wrong in his earlier prosecutions. He had managed to arrest people who were criminals. Not all of them were serious criminals, but they were crooks. And they were people who'd never freaking seen a cop. You know, they were, I mean, Chicago is a tough town. <laughs> now, this guy's a Chicago guy. He's from the old, he's from the old Capone school of like, okay, he's bad, let's invent something to get it, right? We'll just invent something. I mean, I don't care if it's income tax fraud, if he comes for you with a, with a bat, you go for him with a knife, he comes for you with a knife, you like pull out your AK-47, you know, that was Cook's background, you know, and then he like descended on the sleepy, peaceful Pueblo of Austin, Texas. <laughs> You know, with like guns blazing and white unmarked, and then he wouldn't tell anybody. And, you know, and that was just, I don't know, it was tragic. It was really sad. Uh, and when we paid a price for that. I mean, Steve paid a price, Steve's employees paid a price, I paid a price, but also the public interest paid a price. And we're still paying it 20 years later. Okay, so your perspective is that that the tragedy of Cook is is not the other people that he trampled over, but that because this blew up in his face, he was prevented from going out and being the the badass white hat who would have would have nipped computer crime in the bud. The guy was a public servant. Now he's, he's a federal attorney. He's supposed to go out and scourge crime. You know, okay, none of these people are flawless robocops. I don't think Cook had an end to do this. I mean, you know, the guy was reckless. He was, he was, he was the pets.com of computer crime in some sense. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it was really the luck of the draw. 
I mean, he was not that much worse a person than many other people who want to be computer crime prosecutors or prosecutors of any kind. I mean, if you hang out with prosecutors, you know, they're not pleasant people. You know, I mean, I mean, they're they're tough. They're they're tough, predatory. I mean, even the women who are federal prosecutors are like flaring nostril huntresses. You know, they're like. They're, they, they are they are vindictive and uh, you know tough-minded and you know I, well you know I'm not saying Bill Cook is the ideal guy for this. I'm just saying Bill Cook was not that untypical of the Chicago situation. I mean, you know, Chicago's a tough town. Well, I think the point here, really, uh, of all of this is. Or the point of the EFF when the Electron Frontier Foundation was created is that these guys just don't understand this stuff. Everybody was really confused. It's complex. The guys who do understand computing sometimes have trouble communicating about it with the people who don't. I think Barlow's concern and Mitch Kapoor's concern and John Gilmore's concern and guys like Bob Frankston and a bunch of other guys who are still talking about it today, it's like, why is it that people don't get this stuff? They don't get it because it's hard to understand if you don't get it, you know? So if you don't understand computing, if you don't understand technology, and if you don't understand the, the, the cultures that grow around it, I think it's hard to, to kind of get your head around what, what a real risk is or what a real danger is in that environment. I, maybe a narrower, but a different perspective on, on Steve's legacy because I, I hope I don't hear Bruce saying that, that part of the legacy is because we scared prosecutors there's more computer crime out of it. There would have been if Bam is Steve's fault. Uh, I, I have an anecdote from a later case that I did after the Steve Jackson Games trial uh, where I was involved with an ACLU lawyer in Ohio in a not dissimilar lawsuit filed in Cincinnati, uh, where very uh, strong anti-pornography prosecutions were done in Cincinnati, they know that. Um, and when we did discovery in the case from these purported computer expert uh, investigators and prosecutors, we got their training material. Where did you go? What did you learn about conducting computer searches and seizures? And there were stacks of materials that they had learned from the FBI and Quantico and other places about how not to get screwed up like the, the Secret Service did uh, in the Steve Jackson Games case. In fact, there literally were articles saying how not to be sued like the Secret Service was in Steve Jackson Games. Uh, and a former partner of mine, a former federal prosecutor, quite nice guy, Nostrils. I don't remember his nostrils player once, very intelligent, uh, a very conscientious uh, lawyer, worked with the AG, uh, Texas AG, doing computer investigations and coordinating assistance with local prosecutors, with the federal prosecutor. Uh, he was in awe of Steve Jackson, uh, in, in awe of the Steve Jackson Games case, and was very impressed with how the case had helped to improve the federal investigation of computer crime. Uh, how it had improved what they did, how much information they would gather before, the quality of uh, search warrants that they would prepare, and out of a great concern that they not be sued for having bungled uh, an investigation the way the Secret Service did. And so, yeah, it may have tamped down some of the worst enthusiasm by the federal prosecutor but it, it hangs still 20 years later. It hangs over the head of computer crime investigators and prosecutors to know that there is a career-ending potential out there <laughs> if you do this wrong. Because from my perspective, the best client, I had an innocent client. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing to have, is that we went into the courtroom and Steve was weakly clean. And so the entire case was an effort of the Secret Service to justify how they had screwed up so badly. Uh, 
and I didn't have to worry about the buried bodies in the basement of Steve Jackson games because there just weren't any. They had just screwed it up very badly. So anyway, that's, that's part of the legacy of this case. Maybe not a broader perspective, but it's still out there. Part of the case is published in the law books. We know today that when they teach computer investigators, they still talk. They still talk about Steve and what happened to his company. That's an important thing. Let's go to Q and A. Who has a question, Chris? How long did it take to get the computers back? How long did it take to get your computers back? The question was, how long did it take to get the computers back? But months. I want to say four months, and that it, it, it's recorded, but I don't recall the answer. I will tell you that when they came back, they all came back together, stacked in a big crate of, of this kind of construction. What, what was it? You know, the yard on the side. Just everything piled up together. One of the returned computers, when we opened it up, had the loose hard drive from another computer banging around on top of the motherboard. That was back when hard drives were big. Um, yes, uh, right. Not, not a lot of storage compared to these days, but it was a weighty thing. Um, they were... It is impossible for me to know whether they were packed up that way by someone who knew that shipping computers this way would destroy them, or by someone who didn't know. But either idea is terrifying. Yes? So do you think that the video of this talk tonight might end up in the training for the future? <laughs> Do you think the video from this talk tonight might end up in training for? I hope so. You know, one of the one of the legacies is maybe the police, maybe the prosecutors will pay more attention to doing the right thing. I mean, uh, Bruce Bruce made the point that uh, their job is to to nail crooks. Yeah. But their job is not to nail everybody they run across because some of them might have been around crooks at some point. And they, we don't need people on that job who don't know the difference. Yes. Hey, Chris. Um, question for Bruce. Um, you alluded a couple of times, and I may be conveniently misunderstanding what you were referencing, but it seems to me that another side of this case is the publishing angle. That the, you know, what, real or feigned incompetence allowed them to come in to somebody who functioned as a publisher and remove their ability to publish. And I'm wondering if you have any comments on that. Okay. They took away his printing press. There we go. Yeah, you know, the element of prior restraint and the fact that a, that a book that happened to be present on a hard disk that vanished in Secret Service custody was of, of, of intense concern. And uh, you know that certainly made it easier for me to pitch my book. Uh, uh, you know, and it, it, it was a, a clear First Amendment free expression issue, and it was the sort of thing that you know got Amnesty International interested, as opposed to you know simply somebody who's carrying out dodgy computer activities who has this computer stolen for investigative purposes. The fact that the guy was a publisher and that he published many books in the past and he was prepared to publish another book and that book had vanished on the computer. I mean, any author or publisher who had books on computers had to worry at that point. It's like, wait a minute, does this mean that we're now praying to the police? You know, that they, if, if they get wind that there's a book they don't like, can they come and seize our computers and suppress the publication of the book without our ever having a chance at a trial, right? So, you know, that was obviously problematic. Now, you know, there were, there were many other aspects of the case that were similarly bad. Um, but, you know, point of view is worth 80 IQ points in a situation like this. You know, and I can recall asking a cop, one of my informants, so, you know, you guys go out and you seize all these computers. You know, what happens? And when do you give them back? Oh, well, we don't. Well, why don't you give them back? 
computer's back, and you know you're not going to try the guy or charge him with anything. I mean, you're basically confiscating these expensive items. And he said, you know, there's always something illegal in there. You know, and in point of fact, there is something illegal in everybody's computer. You know, and they can, they can easily ask you something like, so do you have a bill of sale for this Microsoft Word? I mean, can you prove that, you know, and who among us keeps paper documentation for software? Can you prove that you own these MP3s? Right? Or, or, you know, I'm looking at your email here, and there's all these solicitations for crimes in here. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like, obviously, criminal activity going on in your computer, you know, and it had never really occurred to them that people would ask for them back. I even had another cop tell me that they could not give the computers back to some of these people because they might be sued by owners of stolen software inside the machine, or by victims of the guy's, uh, you know, credit card depredations, or whatever. So you know, it was not that they didn't understand what computers were. I mean, that the Barlow K4 party line, that they were merely ignorant because it was all a frontier and they didn't know what was going on, was not, in fact, true. So they were not ignorant, they just had their own agenda. So what, what I just wanted to follow up with the rest of the panel, if, if there are any opinions about how this might have impacted publishing and First Amendment cases, uh, I guess Steve may be the secondary on that. Well, there was a law against what they did. Right. Uh, and it was already in the books. Uh, and, but the Secret Service didn't know about it. They, they flat out didn't know about it. It's called the Privacy Protection Act, and it was passed in response to a U.S. Supreme Court decision that actually held that publishers don't have a greater First Amendment protection from raids seeking investigation of crimes. The Stanford Daily, the, the Stanford newspaper, had actually suffered a, uh, a raid, uh, execution of a search warrant, looking for photographs that they had taken when they were covering a student rally that had turned violent. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, sorry, the First Amendment doesn't provide you as a newspaper any greater protection from the execution of search and seizure. If the photographs you took are evidence of a crime, well, you know, you can gather evidence of a crime through uh, a search warrant, or, you know, executing a search warrant. And Congress immediately turned around and passed a law that says, no, that's not the case. Uh, if you are involved in a publishing business and you're not the target of the crime, or the, 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 the alleged crime, then you can't gather evidence from a publisher through a search warrant for obvious reasons because it's incredibly disruptive to the business. It did what they did to Steve. Is they said, well, we think there's evidence of a crime here. We're going to take your computers. We're going to shut your business down. We're going to take your publishing material, and maybe you'll get it back. And so Congress passed one and said, no, you can't do that. You have to use a subpoena. And a subpoena is a scalpel versus a machete when you're looking for information. It gives you an opportunity to say, all right, here's the stuff you're looking for, or to go to court and say they're asking for too much, or can I please simply make a copy of it and give it to the cops rather than have them take the original uh, with a sealed warrant and I have no idea what, uh, why I'm being investigated or what I'm going to get back. Because the short answer to the question for Steve was, when did they give the computers back? The short answer was too late. Too late. Because they had to rewrite the book, essentially. Uh, they had to spend all of the time and all the money and the employee hours to reconstruct the book for what it was. So it was just too late. Yeah. If I can interject briefly, starting the day after the raid, they started promising to return copies of the files that were on there. But that did not happen. That's the one, one of the best images from the trial. Steve was a wonderful witness. Was describing to the federal judge a sort of supplicant as he would go to the Secret Service's offices with his box of empty floppy disks and say, please, <laughs> you know, man, would you please make a copy of, of the drafts of this book that I'm working for and give back to me. And I can still just see Steve walking in there with the old clap and have the court, please. And they would kept saying, no, no, we can't get it back. Not today. Yeah, not today. <laughs> this, is, this is really 
it's a tactic that apparently works on a lot of people. Is you just keep denying and putting off, and eventually, you know, if if you're not intimidated, you'll get tired. And one thing we didn't we didn't touch on. By the way, this was my accidental 15 minutes of fame, so I, I can't take any credit other than having been in the right time, the, the right place, and you know, to have the honor of working on this case. We won most of it, uh, but one of the things, Steve was a plaintiff, his company was a plaintiff, and, and three individuals who were members of his bulletin board system were plaintiffs as well. They were fans, they were game, you know, they were active in the gaming community, but they weren't involved in the company. But they used the bulletin board system to leave and receive and read email, the primitive version of, but email on this bulletin board system. Two of them had actually met through the bulletin board system and developed a romance and been married. They used the bulletin board system to exchange emails and all sorts of things that everybody now routinely exchanges emails, but, by, but at that time, it was still a fairly new thing. So not only did their email get seized by the Secret Service, but we were able to, when we got the discovery from the Secret Service in the civil suit, we were able to look at the software, to reinstall it, and the fellow who had written the software volunteered his time very generously. We analyzed it, and he was able to testify conclusively that the Secret Service had read every single piece of email on the bulletin board system. There were hundreds of pieces of messages, and they were flagged within the database, and, and they had gone through and read every single message. They denied it in court under oath, uh, but the electronic evidence was indisputable, and in fact, the judge, in a written opinion, said, I don't believe the Secret Service. I believe, you know, the actual evidence that they went through and read every one of these messages that these people had left, including very personal messages between people who had personal relationships. Really quite offensive. Uh, and there is a federal, federal law against that, too. Secret Service knew about that one. Uh, but they went ahead and violated it anyway. And, you know, there's a very honorable, you know, written decision by a federal judge saying that crossed the line. And I'm sure these people didn't suffer a business loss like Steve suffered his business loss, but they had rights and those rights were violated and he entered an order saying their federal rights, privacy rights were violated, ordered them a, a statutory award of $1,000 for the nominal damages uh, and you know, just the feeling of righteousness at the end of the day that really the government isn't allowed to do that. Uh, and so that was sort of the other piece. You have the publisher piece of the case where you're involved in writing a book and you have protections against overreaching government intrusions and investigations. And then the other piece is sort of private, I'm allowed to communicate, and simply because I'm using the same computer system as somebody who you mistakenly suspect is involved in a crime is using the system. My privacy rights remain, and the government can't just really, really go in there and rain and read everything that's on the system. But that's another piece of what gets taught uh, when the prosecutors and investigators are now taught how to avoid getting sued. I'm going to ask a question, and then we have another question. Uh, did this happen today? It wouldn't happen the same way because, as Pete says, things need to be better trained now. The obscurity that the whole affair fell into wouldn't play out the same way because we're now a whole lot more connected than we are. If this happened to me today, instead of going on to the one-line smock board and telling a few of the, the people who hung out on that board who also hung out on mine, yeah, you can't get to my bulletin board because the Secret Service took it. I don't know why. I would be boiling that down into 140 characters. <laughs> you see where this is going? <laughs> it is the thing about Smock is that Steve was a member of Smock, Bruce was on Smock, Mike Godwin, the, who had just become counsel at EFF, were on Smock. So it was kind of an interesting place to be telling the story.
I would point out that the Secret Service, who were an independent agency since they were founded by Abraham Lincoln, um, became part of the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11. And it would not happen the same way today, but I really pity anybody who gets in the way of a terror investigation in the United States right now. I mean, if they come up with the invented pretext that you have anything to do with dynamite bombs, Muslims, Austinite guys who fly light aircraft into IRS buildings, <laughs> anything else along that line, the likelihood of you getting a day in court or getting your hardware back or attracting any focused attention from any group of people willing to help you, minuscule. I mean, they, they drop the hammer on Steve, they can drop a truckload of handfuls on people today. So, you know, I, I, would, I would have to say, you know, my, my hope in writing this book was to, you know, civilize the electronic frontier. I would have to say, I mean, just judging by the evidence on the ground, in 20 years we've gone from savagery to decadence without ever encountering civilization, <laughs> really. Uh, and the idea that we're now somehow immune from federal malfeasance, or especially from secret federal investigations, is, is very naive. I mean, we're much more prey to that kind of stuff nowadays. It would be done under another pretext, but, um, you know, the likelihood of our finding that out and achieving justice uh, and retribution has gone way down rather than up. So you think that if a publisher gets graded and slammed on a terror pretext, that would stand up better than the hacking fear ever did? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say so. I'm, I'm not arguing. I'm just making, yeah, I can. I'm not arguing. Uh, but we've got better law now than we did, but there are also a whole lot more people, you know, even in the, uh, the legislative branch, who are, who are officially going to jump up and panic at the word terror than you ever had willing to jump up and panic at the word hacking. Now, remember, hacking was a pretty scary word there for a while. They tried to make it a scary word.
person is innocent, like Steve was, it's harder when you suspect the person is guilty, and it's even harder when it's the, the, the cause de jour, it's the particular thing we're particularly anxious about these days. And in particular, when you get something that, I like the phrase black hole, you know, when you get a black hole effect, you get a situation where all of a sudden the defendant is being required to prove his innocence. That's not the way it's supposed to work. Question? John, we need to swap tapes if you can. We need to what? We need to swap tapes. Okay, swap tapes. We just have a little bit of time left, but let's swap tapes first. You know there's a lot of questions out there. We'll probably take three or four more. We're all realizing we're still real pissed off about this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't win them all. So what more would he say that maybe they could have won in the legal case? Oh. Okay. Did you get that, Pete? Yeah, I repeat it. Yeah, what part, what part did I have? The one part I didn't get is actually the part that's in the law books. It's more of a, more of a lawyer geek issue. Um, there's two pieces of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. One of them protects stored electronic communications, uh, and, and one of them protects or prevents the interception of electronic communications, the wiretapping and uh, even electronic eavesdropping wiretapping. And one of the issues the case raised was whether the seizure of these electronic communications was simply an illegal seizure of stored communications or whether it was illegal wiretapping. And the penalties for illegal wiretapping were higher. And so we wanted to show that it was wiretapping. And it's almost dated because the issue was that these emails, they would come in, they would reside on the bullet board system until the next user, the user who they were addressed to, would log in themselves, retrieve them, and read them. Uh, and our position was for all the email that had been sent but not yet read, it had been intercepted caught between the sender and the receiver. Uh, the government's position was, no, it really was an electronic storage, like a stored communication. And when we took that one issue up to the Court of Appeals, we did it in that the trial court, and the Court of Appeals went against us on that. Uh, it wasn't particularly important because we still showed that the electronic mails were protected from what the government had done, but just what the, the, the level of protection would change a bit. And, and for that, courts, that did become a real precedent, and there's a whole lot of line drawing going on as to what is or isn't, uh, and the, the wiretapping or seizure of electronic communication uh, in all sorts of neat newer contexts, like bullet board system, or I'm, I'm sorry, website communications, and uh, store and forward internet email, and Steve's case has cited this precedent as, they, as the courts sort of work through this particular issue with uh, electronic wiretapping. To me, that's an unfortunate result because, it, among other things, well, yes, it means you have a little less protection because we didn't prevail on that one. But it also seems to have led to the, the chain he's talking about where a lot of time is spent drawing technical lines rather than a broad line on principle, and technical lines change every time the technology changes, and it has changed since we came in here today. I mean, there's always something new going on. And if the courts get bogged down in, in junk like that, uh, we're not getting useful law and useful protection, in my opinion. I think we lost some great opportunities in 1991 because when I was hanging out with these cops and going to events of, their time, of, of that kind, American computer police were unquestionably the most advanced computer police in the world. And, you know, Canadians were showing up and Britons were showing up and Norwegians were showing up and so forth, really there to, like, get the American law enforcement community to tell them how to go out and civilize computers. And I think there was a chance to sort of bake that in 
like an American way of computation that would have like it would have been more just and more free and more in line with American values. And our situation in the US is still an electronic frontier. We never really civilized what was going on. And now people around the world are as likely to look for the Iranians who will lose Twitter to persecute their own activists, or the Chinese who actually have rigid state control over the internet, and they will look for the US as you know, guardians of the public interest in computing. And that was a lost opportunity, and I'm not sure we ever get that one back. Max, did you have a question? Well, I think it's pretty clear that nobody here is terribly sympathetic to the guys who gave Steve such hell. But if I can ask for a huge act of empathy on your part, if you were in those guys' position, or if you were in another perspective, if you were in the position of the lawmakers overseeing those guys, what two or three top principles or guidelines or rules of engagement would you like to see going forward from that? Do your homework. <laughs> and, um, I, I think Bruce and I differ on recklessness versus ignorance. Maybe we can agree that they were recklessly ignorant, but specifically as far as rating us, they, from all testimony, correct me if I'm wrong, they didn't know we were a publisher, which implies that they paid no attention at all to anything except our physical address and the fact that we employed Lloyd. And they don't seem to have been aware that if we happen to be a publisher, we had the protections afforded publishers by the Privacy Protection Act. So, you know, you, you get the image on television of the, the law enforcement agents just meticulously studying their suspects and getting every little detail before they come. No, no, these guys drove in with windbreakers with you know, Secret Service on the back and no idea no idea of either the laws they were enforcing or the, the suspect they were raiding. So, do you think that was a botch? Do you think that they did that in general? And, or was this just a bunch of cowboys that were a little bit less uh, refined in their approach? Yes, 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 and yes. I never understood why the Chicago unit and Tim, who was a you know, Secret Service guy in Chicago, could not just go to the Austin Secret Service, because of course there was a Secret Service office, and just have some guy drive by in plain clothes and like scope out the building before they raided it. And you know, to me this indicates that there was a very tight clique around Cook and that he in fact did not want to tell other people in law enforcement, and probably because he was eager to get all the glory himself. He didn't want to play his hand, he wanted to be the one heroic guy who would crack the case. You know, and in order to do that, he was like single-handedly charging the machine gun this, when just you know, a couple of days of reconnaissance would have been a much, much smarter thing for him to do. So, you know, I, I, I do put myself in good shoes, and, and, I, and I, I don't think he's a stupid man, but I think he was swept up in the fervor of events, and that he was motivated by glory, you know, and really ambition, and, uh, and he was reckless. And, I, you know, I, and, and because of and his recklessness made him ignorant. I mean, he, he did not commit any such mistakes on his own home turf. It was the fact that he was trying to run this raid by remote control. It somehow didn't seem real to him. You know, he, he didn't make any effort to make it real. And he ended up basically drinking his own bath water. The guy believed his own hype, you know? He was believing his own legend. And, and that's really unforgivable. No, it's, it's unforgivable in a man with as much capacity to harm other people in a responsible office. It, it was a dereliction of duty on his part. Right? So, you know, I, I, I don't, 
I mean, we all have flaws. It could have worked out differently for this guy. You know, there, there are other people who've done things worse than he who are in positions that are fine. You know, he's not, I mean, he's, he's a wealthy Chicago lawyer, but it should not have happened. It should not have happened, and, you know, fruits would have been in order there. Just double, a little double checking of the facts. And, you know, and, and a little less eagerness to hide the ace up his own sleeve. The, the, the detail, they, they, they use a local investigator, a UT security investigator, to do a little bit of groundwork, but I don't think they told him what was going on. They had to look into Lloyd, because I think Lloyd was a part-time UT student, or had been. And, and then they essentially completely mistranslated the information that they got from him, or attributed information to this UT security guy that he didn't, that did not provide them. Put it into a sworn uh, search warrant. And then we had fun when it interviewed this guy. He wasn't at all committed to the investigation. It was this sort of shoulder shrugging as well. These Secret Service guys asked me to do this. And so, yeah, I, I provided a little bit of information. And we went through the, the uh, search warrant. And this was our, our first witness at the trial that we called with the UT security person. We didn't call the Secret Service. We didn't call the prosecutor. We didn't call Steve. The very first witness we put on the stand was the UT security guy, who was named as the source of a whole bunch of incriminating information in the search warrant. And so we put the search warrant on a stand, blown up, and we walked him through it. He says, well, the search warrant says you told the Secret Service this. Did you? No. <laughs> uh, well, the, secret, no, the search warrant says you told the Secret Service this. Did you tell him that? No. And it was five or six blatant misrepresentations in the search warrant, all running back to not their own sources, people they control, but this, this local UT guy that they had puffed up in the search warrant to make it look like it was a team and there was a local presence and this was really something that, that investigated locally. And it blew up in their face. And the judge that we had is a judge who makes up his mind pretty early in the case and learned through my career. Is you gotta you gotta score your points early with this judge, and if you don't, you're behind the game the entire time. And I think I'm convinced that after we put on a local witness who disavowed the information that the search warrant attributed to him, that the case was in our pocket from then on. Uh, that, the, that the judge drew all of Bruce's conclusions immediately from this one witness. That that there's something going on here that isn't based on the facts and the evidence that they had. That there's something that drive. Uh, and so, it, that'd be my answer is do, do your homework and know your sources. And if you're getting exaggerated information from a private company that might have its own agenda, uh, if you're using somebody local, you better be, you know, better be careful and be accurate about what you're getting on local on the scene. Because if it looks like it's getting driven from Chicago on some other agenda, uh, you can get, get hammered if you come to your hometown. Very much bad information. Let's take one more quick question if there are any. Anybody got a question? Yeah, already. What was the timeline on actually getting money back? What was the timeline on getting money back? And this is the last question. Um, well, let's see. The raid was in 1990. March of 90, lawsuit was filed in 1991. We tried the case January of 1993, uh, the day after my 30th birthday. Uh, kept me from having a 30th birthday party, so I'll always remember that. Uh, we won shortly after, February, March, we got, we got the ruling. The government did not appeal the part they lost, which I consider to be fairly honorable. <coughs> and so they paid the damages probably sometime mid-1993. So yeah, three and a half years. And, and even that, the compensation to the Steve's company was woefully inadequate, uh, although there was something.
Yeah, no, sitting on the couch talking about old times. Um, the, the judgments in the case covered all of the legal fees, and there were, there were additional damages. They weren't huge, but we were not in this for huge damages. We were in this to make a point and so I could be left alone to make games. I, I, my, my life plan and business plan is not to have the government give me a whole lot of money. It's to make games. Good ones. Yeah, let me, let me just add that to it was a full disclosure. You know, when I, when I agreed to write this book, or when I actually proposed this book to my publisher, I figured that it too was going to be some kind of legalistic gesture, that I was going to be dropping my novel writing, which was pretty lucrative at the time, and that I was going to have to do this thing just to keep these freaking Chicago cops off my cyberpunk net. Uh, you know, in the course of writing the book, I came to know basically everybody who could have come and busted me. <laughs> and I've never had any trouble from the police since. <laughs> but, but also, you know, ironically, and, and this often seems to be the case in publishing, the book made a lot of money. I mean, kind of a lot of money. <laughs> and it made money in markets that I never expected it to make money. You know, it's, one of, it's been one of the most internationally translated of my books. It's like a Korean version with cartoons in it. You know, I, I still get fan mail about it. Uh, you know, the, the IRS bought crate loads of them to like educate IRS agents when for some, some reason it stayed in print, or it's still in print, I mean, it's still in print, but it made money for many, many years. Well, you know, it's always been available on the net. I mean, it was one of the first books that was distributed on the internet and bullet board systems under what later became Creative Commons at the time there was no such thing. But, you know, and that, that action, I mean, people often ask me, gosh, you know, you gave away your Steve Jackson book. That must have cost you a lot of money and royalties. That made me famous. <laughs> that gesture made me famous. Oh, and, uh, and fame is worth more to a writer than cash, which we just drink away anyway. <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 was one of those, it was one of those odd businesses. I mean, I suffered to do it. Steve suffered for it. Steve's employees suffered. You know, there were damages. But, you know, there were some very considerable silver linings in that particular cloud. And, um, you know, I would have to say it was a maturing experience. I learned plenty by that. And it darkened my temperament in some ways because crime is ugly. And you might think that if you write thriller novels and you like to read cyberpunk novels, for instance, that like computer crime is really glamorous, that's not so. And confronting evil and sort of learning how things go badly makes one unhappy in many ways. But on the other hand, it gives you a more solid stance. And um, gosh, 20 years. I, you know, I, I thought I was over my anger of what had happened. <laughs> not even I close. No, not even close. But just sitting here, you know, for two hours, I'm enraged all over again. <laughs> it feels good, damn it. <laughs> Well, law of unintended consequences here, uh, I happen to very much like versus fiction, so if, if one of the effects of this was that you wrote less fiction, oh well, it got me in a way I didn't even know about until now. So, uh, you know, this is good too. It is available on the net, streaming audience out there. If this has interested you enough that you're still watching this, you should uh, Buy it if you can, or download it. It's a good book. It's fun to read. Title. The title, please. The Hacker Crackdown. That's it. Thanks, everybody.